And uh, this Sunday is a Sunday that we have been looking forward to for a while. It is Commitment Sunday. Some of us are in fear and trepidation, while others of us are ready for the adventure. And, um, and honestly, all of us come together because of the incredible blood of Jesus. That's what uni- unites us uh, together. And we are so thankful that uh, all of you are here. Um, the reality is, is the decisions uh, that we make uh, today um, as we commit ourselves for the next two years will impact the life of our church. It will impact this community. It will impact generations to come. It will impact in ways that is honestly even beyond what we can even imagine. And uh, we are in this incredible defining moment in the life of a church. We've never been in this place before. Uh, We've never been in this place where where we're uh, asking, where we're calling out, where we're praying, where we're seeking God's face on, on, Lord, what would you want me to give financially? And and here's the thing. Here's what's so interesting about finances. As I was just worshiping um, with, with the stand, that song, I stand heart abandoned in awe of the one. Um, when I was singing that, there was something powerful for me personally. As I was singing those songs and about surrendering all and thinking of today, surrendering my finances. There's something different about that for me. And uh, I, because I think there's just something about finances that you, man, you just want to hold on to. And uh, and, and I just want to, man, I'm just praying uh, for all of us, honestly, to be freed from that. And uh, and to be able to give generously and to give sacrificially and uh, and to give with with incredible freedom uh, to what God has for us. And so uh, we've been praying, we've been looking forward to this Sunday as we start this journey. It's a two year journey. 2.5 2.5 million dollar journey uh, that we are on, and that is to purchase a facility. It's to help build a dentist office. It's to partner up with an orphanage in Africa, and uh, and honestly, the heart of Arise, uh, beyond anything financial, is life transformation. Our desire is to see all of us become generous people, and to see God move in powerful ways, and to see lives transformed. And that is honestly why we uh, are on this journey. And why God has put this incredible journey in front of us. And um, I'm really excited about the stories uh, that we're going to have as we walk through this journey. Have you ever realized that every defining moment, there's, it always leads you with a story to tell? Right? I mean, think about your life. Uh, think back about, about those moments, uh, you know, maybe where you decided to have a child. Or uh, you, you, were, you, know, you kind of were thinking about uh, a job and what kind of job you would take. When you were thinking about... Um, you know, a situation within your family dynamic, whether it's marriage or not marriage, or do we buy a new house or we not buy a new house, kind of those defining moments, they always leave you with a story to tell. And, and story is so powerful in the life of people. And I, and I can look back at defining moments in my, in my life, and, and I see times where, where I'm like, man, I am so thankful, I trusted, I put my faith in God, and I followed Him, and I did what he called me to do. And there are times, there are defining moments in my life that I look back at and I go, wow, did I screw that one up. Wow. There are times I look back at those defining moments and I think, well, I got by, but I got by because I lied. Or I got by because I cheated. Or I got, li- you know, I got by because I did certain things. You know, what's the story that we're going to tell as a church? When you're in a defining moment personally, what's the story that you want to tell in the midst of your crisis? Be thinking about it. That's a great question to ask in the midst of a defining moment. When you're in the midst of divorce, when, when you're in the midst of having a child, when you're in the midst of family conflict, when you're in the midst of all those things, what's the story that you want to tell? It helps you make decisions of the way that you want to live. And the reality is as church, as we approach This day of commitment, there is going to be a story to tell. And what I love is each and every one of us will have individual stories to tell. We're going to have a church story, and you yourself are going to have a story. And my hope is that you are going to have an incredible God story to tell people. Uh, Turn to the book of Esther. We're going to look at one of uh, 
one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. Uh, she is in a defining moment uh, in her own life. It's a defining moment uh, for the Jewish people. And uh, it's just a powerful moment of really seeking the Lord and, uh, and what he has. So before we go, let me, let me pray. Lord God, Lord, I just pray for this time. I pray for this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will speak clearly to us. Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this place. Lord, move in us, strengthen us, give us faith, and trust and dependence on you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the book of Esther, let me, you can turn to Esther chapter 4. That's where we're going to be going this morning, and, and I just want to kind of bring you into the context. I want to kind of bring you into what's going on uh, with, with Esther. What's going on, there's, there's two major characters that we'll be looking at in Esther chapter 4. There's a guy named Mordecai and, and a woman named Esther. And uh, Esther had a tough life growing up. Esther, uh, both her mom and dad had died. And so she was left all alone. All right. Mordecai, who was her cousin, came alongside Esther and said, I'm going to help raise you. I'm going to raise you up as my own daughter. And that's powerful right there in, in that moment. And, uh, and the thing about Mordecai, Mordecai is a Jew. Esther is a Jew. And uh, Mordecai, though was taken into exile. So, so the Israel nation is kind of broken up, and they've been taken into exile. And so Mordecai and Esther find themselves in a land that is foreign to them. They're, they're not in a comfortable place anymore. All right? And, and what happens within um, Esther, with, what happens within Esther chapter 2 and chapter 3 is, and there's a powerful story in there about Mordecai and the crisis that they come to. See, what happens is there's a guy, there's a noble, there's a kind of like a, a not a king, but a, a noble uh, named Haman. And every time Haman would walk into a room, all right, or, or down the street, people would bow down and they would honor him. All right, you guys got that? Kids, you got that? So, so if, if Haman was walking down, you, you'd bow down and you'd honor him. All right? So, so that's what would happen. Well, Mordecai would not bow down. He would not honor Haman. And, and what happened, what, what came out of that was that, was that Mordecai told uh, told people that he was a Jew and therefore he would not bow down. Well, Haman didn't like that. He was like, I want you to bow down. And Mordecai's like, I'm not going to bow down. You see, you see the problem? All right. And Mordecai's like, well, I'm a Jew, so I'm not bowing down. And, and so Haman's got this brilliant idea. He goes, to, he goes to the king because he knows the king very well and says, hey, king, this Jew, Mordecai, isn't bowing down and honoring me. So, hey, let's do this. Let's kill them all. Let's kill them all, right? Not just Mordecai, let's kill all the Jews. Let's kill them. And, and so King Xerxes is like, all right, sounds good to me. Because Haman was going to give a lot of money, right? He's going he's to put in a lot of stuff in the treasury if this happened. So the king does, you know, sends out an edict, all right, to, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews. All right, so you can just imagine, imagine what, what it would be like if all of a sudden, one day, there's an edict, there's, there's a letter that's in your mailbox, and you read the letter, and it says, every follower of Jesus will be killed in a week. How would you respond? Would you be in crisis? Yes. Life's on the line, right? So you're going, whoa, what's happening? Imagine that. This is what was going on in this time, all right? Look at Esther chapter 3, Esther chapter 3, verse 13, says this. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. See, every defining moment, there's a crisis. See, our story that we are going to tell has a crisis. The reason why we are going on a rise on this generosity initiative is because there is a crisis. Let, let, me, let me tell you about the crisis. Let me just introduce to you some of my friends. 
Two of my friends are going through a divorce. They have not told their kids yet. Do you think they're in a crisis? I think so. One of my friends, who I've just gotten to know recently, has gone through a divorce, has now two little kids to raise, and he doesn't know where to go. Is he in a crisis? I think so. One of my friends, uh, who I know very well, believes that as long as he does good works, he's saved. He's good. Is he in a crisis? I think so. One of my friends, their kids are wandering away from God and, and no longer kind of believing or following Jesus Christ. Are they in a crisis? We're in a crisis. Now, now if you ask me, are you, are, am I personally in a crisis? Uh, honestly, I'm doing okay. Got a beautiful wife. Got great kids. I absolutely love my job. I mean, I, I mean I'm so thankful. To be a pastor, it, it is one of the greatest jobs you could ever have. My kids, at this point, praise God, <clears throat> are doing well. But let me tell you something. See, in Esther, Israel's crisis, or the Jews' crisis, became Esther's crisis. And people, if, if, if we don't understand that the crisis that we're in is that people need Jesus, you'll never feel like there's a crisis. And, and therefore, there's no movement forward because you think we're all okay. And the reality is, you may be as Queen Esther, you may be in a comfortable spot. You may have it together. But there is a crisis that is going on that we need to open up our eyes to. And if we don't step up and arise to the situation at hand, people will be lost. Now, now I, I know what you're going to say. And I, I was going to say this later in the message, but I better just say it now. I, I know what some of you are thinking right now. Because I'm with you. God's sovereign. God's sovereign. He knows all things. But, but let me tell you something. God's sovereignty never gives us permission to leave our responsibility. You get that? God's sovereignty does not give us permission to go, oh, I don't need to share my faith with Jesus, which is our responsibility. I believe God is going to do an incredible work with or without us in Bolingbrook, but it does not give us permission to let go of our responsibility. People, there's a crisis. And I know that you know of people who are in crisis. You know of people who are doubting their faith. You know of people who don't know Jesus. You know of people who, are, who, who know Jesus, but their marriage is falling apart. You know of people who, who are following Jesus faithfully, but their family is struggling. You know of people, right, who, 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 yeah, you're following Jesus, but your friend who you sit at the bar with every night or whatever, hopefully not every night, but some nights, all right, all right, they're, they're lost and they need Jesus and you know that and, and you got you to gotta feel that. Every story has a crisis to overcome and our story has a crisis to overcome and people arise is about life transformation. It is about helping people in need. Listen to me. It is, about, it, it is about growing more so that we can give more. People, God has placed us in this community to glorify Him and to help people come to know and experience God. And the reality is, our crisis, as every crisis does, it, it, it's, it leads to an individual decision. Look at, look at verses 9 to 11. If you remember the crisis that has just happened in verse 13, Mordecai now goes to Esther. Mordecai's going, you know what, Esther, you're in this position. You can help out. You can do something about this because you're queen. 
And so Mordecai and Esther begin to kind of write back and forth. They begin to have this dialogue uh, through, through, the written, uh, through the written word. And, and Mordecai says to Esther, hey, help us out. You know what I mean? You can do something about this crisis. You, you can do something about this. But Esther's like, yo, Mordecai, look at the problems I got going on. Look at, look at what Esther said. Hathach, which is Esther's helper or servant, went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. And then she, so then Esther instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. Not jail. Not, not just kind of, hey, you're going to be beaten for a little while. Death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. What, what Esther's saying here is, look, Mordecai, I, I see the issue. I see the crisis. But you know what? There, there's, <laughs> there's some serious issues that I got going on for me to go to the king. I've got, my, I, I've got problems. I've got reasons not to go. See, in, in, in every crisis, it's going to lead us to make a decision. And, and let me tell you something. In, in, every, in those defining moments, in, in, in those crises of life, there, there's always a reason, there's, and there's good reasons not to do it. Good reasons. Esther had a good reason not to go forth, didn't she? Wouldn't you say that your life, death, is a good reason not to go? Say that's a good reason. I don't know about you, but that, I mean, I, that would make me think a couple times, right? There's always good reasons to, 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 not, to not move forward. But the reality is, is that Esther is left with this decision to make. What will, what will she do? Let's look at chapter 4, verse 12. So when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Wow. Now it just got personal, right? Whoa, wait, my life is on the line. See, you realize when, when, when you hold back from God, honestly, it, it, it changes the dynamic of your relationship with God. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Esther has a huge decision to make. Will she step up or will she let someone else? Will she be the one who's bold enough, courageous enough to say, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm in this position, and I'm going to go forward, and I'm going to trust. Or is she going to go, yeah, you know, choose someone else. If I, I, if I was in Esther's shoes, this is what I'd be thinking. Lord God, I will go. I will go. Just show me what the king's going to do. Are you with me on that? I'm willing to go, God. I'm willing. Just tell me a little bit of the future. Am I going to make it out of that room? If I make it out of the room, I'll go. Are you with me on that? Because that, I mean, I mean, that's where I'm at a lot of times in life. And let me tell you something. We miss out. I, I'll tell you just, just my personal experience with, with this whole Arise thing. I mean, this has been going on for months. We, we've been praying. We've been looking at land. We've been looking at different property. We've been looking at facilities, all these kind of things. And all of a sudden, things become narrower and more narrower and more narrow, you know, and all these kind of things. And all of a sudden, you begin to go, all right, Lord, is this, is this the deal? And, and let me just tell you something. I mean, a couple months ago, I was, I was just at this place. I was like, Lord, you know what? I'm willing. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to give. I'm willing to sacrificially give. I'm willing to generous, generosity. I'm willing to be generous when I give. I'm willing 
just give me some answers, okay? Is Romeoville going to approve the facility? Tell me that. If you tell me that, I'll keep going, right? With me? All right, or, or this, or this. All right, tell me if the bank would even consider a loan. Right? I mean, how, how are we going to do this? And then, and then here's the third thing I really want to know from God. God, um, can you please tell me what the congregation can give? Just tell me. Because if you can, if you can tell me what the congregation can give, then I can write that number down, and every, I mean, we'll be, woohoo, it'll be great. It'll be so much fun. Like, I'll be, I mean, right? And God's like, yeah, I'm not going to tell you those things. And let me tell you something. Now that I'm through some of it, <laughs> I am so thankful that he didn't tell me. And this is why. Because my relationship with him is so much stronger now than it was before. Because now my life is living by faith and trust rather than in the answers that I know will happen. People, it is the greatest thing of what you want to experience. An intimate relationship with God is the greatest thing that we can have in this life. And the way that we experience this, as scary as it is, is to step out in faith, to trust Him, to keep moving forward, to keep following Him with everything that we have, and make the decision to say yes without all the answers given. Will you, will, will you be willing to do that? Will we arise as a church? Let me just tell you one, one other story. Um, in, in this whole process, as we were praying and planning through um, what we kind of call this series, uh, what we kind of call uh, Arise, um, we, had, we had a great name to begin with. I thought it was fabulous. The name for the sermon series was going to be The Plunge. All in and making waves. It was fabulous. Don't you remember the nesty plunge? Right? Go like this, and then you fall back, and then boom, all these waves. I'm like, yes, that's it. Like, we'll fall back. And I'm like, there's pain, though, when you go back. But that's okay. Like, then these waves make, and it's going to be awesome. Like, like, we can do all these kinds of things with it. And, and, and I shared this with, with a team of people, and, and they started to laugh, as you did. Why are you laughing? And all of a sudden, all these potty jokes, all these potty jokes started to come out. The, plun the plunger, we can hand out plungers, it'll be great. And then if we don't get the, you know, the, the, the financial gift, we can plunge it right on down. You know, we can, all these kind of things. And, uh, and so uh, we were, once again, in crisis and, and a, a meeting was coming up where I had to change the name. We had to come up with a different name because I'm like, I don't want potty jokes going on the entire time of the plunge. And so we got to change something. And so I uh, went to bed uh, a night before the meeting, and uh, I just asked the Lord. I said, Lord, I said, please just give me a name. Give me a word. Give me a phrase. Give me a verse. Give me something from, from you, Lord, that I just know that you're in this, that you, that you want us to go in this direction, that, that you're there. And, um, and that night... I did not get a dream. I woke up the next morning, and, and the phrase, the word that came into my mind was arise. It was arise. And I said, Lord, if, if you want us to go down this journey, if, the, if, this is the, if this is the phrase, if this is the word you want to use for the sermon illustration, the sermon series, then, then, then Esther 4 needs to have the word arise. I, I, I mean, don't normally test God like that. Like, that's a little bit foolish, Right? But that, that was just where I was at. And uh, I turned to Esther chapter 4. I turned to verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. And what God was just saying loud and clear to me, and I believe to us as a church, people, it's time for us to arise. God has called us to be the people who step out in faith. 
God has called us to be the ones. He has given to us an incredible vision of homes of faith. He desires to see that in the lives and the kids throughout this community. People, we need to be willing. We need to will, we need, we need to decide that we're on that journey all out, give everything that we have as far as our lives, you know, financially, just lay it on the line, be able to surrender our lives to you and, and, and follow you and all that we have. People, we are going to have a story to tell. And our story is going to have a crisis to overcome, a decision to be made. And finally, our story will lead to sacrifice. Our story will lead to sacrifice. Look at verse 14 again. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. And then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Wow. Wow. People, our story will lead to sacrifice. Verse 14 is an incredible verse because it begins, it, it, it sets direction for your life. See, you are either in the place that you are to receive from God or you are in the place that you are to serve God. Do do, do you see see this? See, what can happen is as as we as followers of Jesus, we can be going, hey, Lord, can you give me this job so that I can do this? And can you you give me this? And and all of a sudden we, we, we end up and we sit back and we go, ah, all right, we got it. You know, thank you, God, you've given me a wonderful wife. You've given me wonderful kids. You've given me a wonderful job. You've given me it all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And then we just kind of go and live on our merry way. But God says to all of us, have I not put you there so that you can serve me? Is not Esther there so that she can serve God? And are we not at the places in our life so that we can serve him? There's a reason why you go to the company that you go to. The reason why you go to work, the reason why you go is not to get a paycheck. It's because God sees you in that place and says, you are going to be the light in the midst of darkness. You are going to share the gospel with those that you work with. You are there to do those things. It's not just to earn a paycheck. And people, we as a church, we have not gathered together so that we can come in every Sunday, worship God, thank Him for all that He's done for us, have communion, do some baptisms, and all those things. Those things are all good, but He has called us together to do something greater, to serve Him in ways that are beyond us, to live a life of sacrifice. And why would we ever live a life of sacrifice? Because Jesus Christ Himself lived a life of sacrifice. He gave his very life so that you could have life. And you know what the gospel calls us to? Nothing less than to die. Nothing less. The call for all of us is the same. To lay our lives down for the gospel. To worship him in every way. We've lost sight of that. Even the church has lost sight of that. We, we, make, we make Jesus like this. Hey, if you come and put your faith in Jesus, your life is going to be awesome. It is going to be beautiful. He's going to provide everything for you. Blah, 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 blah. You know, all these kind of things. And although some of those things are true, the call of the Christian life is to come and die. To come and serve. To come and give everything that you have so the gospel can be advanced. And people, when we do that, we will have an incredible story to tell. And the story will no longer be about you. The story will be about the greatest one who has come, who has died, and who has been risen from the grave. Jesus Christ. 
Don't you want to have a God story? Don't you want to have a faith story? Don't you want to have a story that you look back at and you go, wow, God just did incredible things in my life. Don't miss out. Don't miss out on that. And people, it, yes, it is financially. I know for me personally, man, I, I, whew, I, I've never personally gone through a generosity initiative in my life. And I tell you what, we have just been um, just wiped clean, honestly. We, we have just gone, man, Lord, I, I don't know. I don't know. And, and yet there's part of me that needs to die, and that's okay, right? But it's not just finances. It's, it's with what I do with my time. It's with what I do with my life. It's with how I coach a soccer team. It's with the conversations I have with parents down the street. It's with my neighbors. It's with all those things. Everything. To live a life completely sacrificed for the king of this world. Church, what will be our story? What is the story that we are going to tell? There's a video that we want to show, show you with a story to tell. My name is Tim Clam, and uh, this is my wife, Carrie. And we have two kids, Marissa and Ty, and we've been coming to the sanctuary for three years. We attended a church previously before this, and uh, they went through a generosity initiative to raise money for a new building. And we had both kind of said, all right, how much do we want to give? And we kind of both went away from each other and prayed about it. And then we wrote down some numbers and came back. And we were very challenged by the numbers that we put down and said, ah, we can do it. It's going to hurt. We could have taken the resources that he had given, he's given us and we could have used it for ourselves. Or we could have said, you know what, we're challenged to set this amount aside and just give and see what God does with it and see how God provides for us. Um, and we just said, you know what, the investment that we're making now has eternal purposes. It's something that's going to last far longer than anything we could ever drive or live in or send our kids to school in. Um, we just said, okay, that's the right thing to do is follow God's leading. When we put the number down and we said, hey, what can we do? We just felt like in order to take a, a step up of faith and move up into that area, we had to do it. We had to be obedient. We said, hey, God has blessed us. There's no reason why we cannot give this number. And uh, just looking back, even though we don't attend that church anymore, I still go, what a great, I don't regret it one bit. Even though it was a large chunk of change, I don't regret it one bit going, you know what, it was an eternal investment. It wasn't something just for a building. Although it might seem like it's a building, it's for something far greater than that. I have thought about involving Marissa and Ty and asking them, here's what our church is doing. Would you like to be part of it? Would you like to give some of your monthly allowance? for a certain amount of time and just know that um, this is this is the reason we're doing it and and I think they would want to be a part of that. I think this is a great opportunity for them to know that uh, what our church is doing and that there are steps that we need to take as a body to come together and um, work towards this common goal and Marissa and Ty can be part of that. Kids can be part of it too. Letting the Holy Spirit lead you. Let the Spirit prompt you. If, you, or if you're sitting across from someone and they say they've got a need and you have the, the resources to fulfill it, I think you need to be obedient and just listen to the Spirit lead you and say, all right, if I can help you out, I'm gonna do it. And it's really not the amount that he's looking for, it's the heart that you're willing to give what you have. So God doesn't need cash. God just wants willing hearts to give what they've been given. I think everybody's got something to give. Um, and sometimes we hold those things closest to us because we think there's no way. I, I can't afford to do this. My budget is this amount. And um, I think everybody should just try it. Just try it. Test God and see where, where your walk is at. Being part of a generosity initiative is a great opportunity for the whole body to pull its resources together and say, look what we can all do and bring this to fruition where we thought it couldn't be possible. And now we're like, man, all of our little things that we have to offer plus God could bring about something that was way beyond anything we imagined.
team to come on up. Well, that's the challenge. There's the opportunity. And um, honestly, it's time for us to come together in a way that we never have had before as a body. And I just want to reiterate uh, what Tim said on the video, and that is to follow the Holy Spirit. Um, I truly believe there is freedom when you give. Um, there's freedom in it. And uh, as the Lord leads, as the Holy Spirit lays on your heart different things, uh, I pray that, that you will have the courage, honestly, to write it down. Uh, my concern more, honestly, is, is the courage for you to write it down and what the Lord's telling than, than what the Lord's telling you. And uh, I just really want to encourage you um, in, in that. Yeah, the ushers are going to hand out some commitment cards, so um, if the ushers can come on down and they're just going to hand out these commitment cards to all of you so that you all will at least be able to participate and at least be able to look at a card. Uh, if you're new here this morning and you're like looking at that card and you're like, what in the world is going on? Uh, honestly, it is a great opportunity to watch a church commit itself together. It really is. And honestly, maybe the Lord is going to lead you to participate with us. It'd be awesome. It'd be phenomenal. Uh, we'd love it. And, um, but honestly, at least you'll be able to witness uh, what a church, what it is like for a church to, to come together and, and commit uh, to one another. And you know, as we've gone through this process, Michelle and I have been challenged and so encouraged as we've talked uh, to you. Um, one family said to us, we're going to give three times more than what we are currently giving. And uh, honestly, that challenged Michelle and I to the point that we are going to give uh, over three times what we normally give. Uh, another family said, rather than contributing uh, to their 401k, they're going to consider giving all that money to the church. Uh, and in light of that challenge, Michelle and I have made ourselves that same challenge. Another family going to sell stock. Another family uh, hearing about <laughs> their, their new tax break bracket after, uh, after their giving. Uh, uh, texted me uh, and said, uh, hey, we're going to give $20,000 more. Uh, raise, raise our card to $20,000 more. It's just, it's awesome to think about that. Uh, I did ask some of our ministry leaders to come together and, uh, and if they were willing to kind of reveal what their commitments were, uh, to kind of be an encouragement to us uh, as a body, because 2.5 million seems pretty overwhelming, doesn't it? 2.5, that's a lot of money. And, uh, and so last week, uh, there were 39 who were willing, 39 giving units who were willing to kind of reveal where God uh, has them and what God has done. And, uh, and through, through that giving, 1.1 million uh, was already, has already been raised. Isn't that awesome? Praise God for that. So that leaves us 1.4 million to go, people. 1.4 million that we have left that as, as we're praying that God will lay on your hearts uh, and, um, and, and one of the most encouraging things, honestly, that night was that somebody uh, is, gonna, is, is committing to give for the first time. Isn't that awesome? I mean, it's awesome. It's part of what Arise is all about. Arise, I mean, as Kiri's talked about, Arise is not just about the amount of money as much as it is about trusting God and being willing uh, to give. And, um, and so I just want to encourage all of you. Uh, you've all received commitment cards, I believe, by now. Go ahead and look at that commitment card, and um, you can look inside, and you can see uh, some different lines and, uh, and what God has been laying on you. This is really just a worksheet uh, for you to use. Um, I know some of you have heard this before, but others have never heard this, and uh, you know, this is just kind of a worksheet for you to be able to process through, to get your two-year generosity commitment, and I just want to be clear. You know, this includes what you regularly tithe. This includes what you regularly give. All right, so it's all one number. It is not separate. This is not like a building campaign and, uh, and then our operating expenses. It's all one number. And so really want to encourage you uh, to, fill, to fill that out uh, as well. I do want to encourage as well, if the leaders that had already revealed their commitments, we want you to experience this moment again. Uh, we want you to, to bring your cards forward again. Uh, it's just a great moment to kind of be a part of this as, as the church and, and to give together. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but Michelle and I actually took this week and continued to pray about our number. And uh, we actually raised our number through the week. Uh, this morning, my wife texted me and said, let's go for it. And uh, honestly, for the first time, I got scared, right? See, before I could calculate how I was going to get to the number, and now I'm scared. And that's a good place. I think that's a good place. It's a good place for me. And um, 
in place for us. So maybe, maybe the Lord's led you uh, in that way as well. And I uh, just really want to leave you some time now to pray, to seek out the Lord. Uh, the band is just going to play uh, behind us. Take some time. Maybe you want to talk to your wife, talk to your spouse, uh, see where the Lord is, is leading you. And, uh, and just really want to encourage you to take some time, take some space right now, and just seek the Lord and what he would put on your heart to be able to give. processing through the two-year commitment that once again includes your regular giving to the church. Lord, we pray that you will do an incredible work in our congregation. Lord, we pray that as we, um, as we give, Lord, that you will bless. Lord, I pray for those who are um, just really struggling with what to do. Lord, I pray for freedom. I just pray for your grace. I pray for clarity. I, I pray, Lord, even in these moments as we just seek your face, Lord, that you will make those things clear. Lord, I pray that we will be generous people and a generous church that meets the needs of those who need you. Lord, direct us in this moment. Lead us and guide us. just want to encourage you as the Lord leads and as the band begins to sing, just to put that number on that bottom line that's really all we need from you is that bottom line fill and then come forward and put them in one of these baskets I want to encourage you as well with kids this is the time for you to give as well um, a million pennies to arise and I uh, really want to encourage you as well this is the time for you to come with your family with your parents and give what you're going to give as well to the Lord
rise, carry hope, let love shine, and show this world the mercy is alive. Mercy is alive. Hope is alive because of your coming. And Lord God, we pray that we will be a body that brings hope to this world. Lord, that we will tell people of the hope that we have in you. Lord God, we pray over these commitments. We just pray, Lord, that you will bless, that you will give generously back, that people will just continue to grow in their generosity. Lord, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Arise is so much more than just $2.5 million. The reality is the ultimate goal of Arise is to become radically generous people. That's what God desires to see. The reality is we can reach our goal with $2 million if we're radically generous. We can reach our goal if it's $4 million if we're radically generous. Just praise God for what God is going to do. Amen? Stand up. Let's sing our closing song. Let your heart be sound. Let your love.
I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen? Hey, thank you for coming this morning. If you need to be prayed up, if you need some prayer, please come forward. we got people who want to pray for you. Please come.